Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the show today. I'm Jasmine Williams. I usually produce the program, but I've jumped into the driver's seat just for the moment because our presenter, Dr. Helen Caldicott, is uh, on a lecture tour of North America and Europe. We'll hear from her very shortly, but first... We're going to get an update on what's happening at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. We're speaking to Arnold Gunderson. He's an energy advisor with 39 years of nuclear power engineering experience. During his career, Arnold managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the United States. He joins us now from Vermont. Arnold, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, Now, there are reports today, uh, it's morning here in Australia on the 29th of March, um, that Japan may have lost the race to save one of the reactors at the Fukushima plant. Um, But can you just bring us up to speed a little bit about what's actually been happening there since the earthquake on March 11th, 2011? Um, Sure. It it seems like um, the earthquake caused the plant to shut down automatically, and there's actually six reactors at that um, at the Fukushima Daiichi um, site, and they all shut down automatically, but that doesn't stop the heat from being generated inside a nuclear core, um, because after the uranium splits, there's still radioactive daughter products, and they give off a lot of heat. About 6% of the total power comes from them. So the unit shut down, and it had to be continuously cooled. Everything was going fine until the uh, the uh, tidal wave hit, the tsunami, and it um, flooded the unit and wiped out the emergency diesels, which provide the electricity to the pumps that were cooling the nuclear reactor. Now, because right before it had been an earthquake that knocked out all site power, the plant had no power to run the pumps. And we call that station blackout. And what, what that means is that they have to get power back within about eight hours. Um, and they have batteries that last about eight hours. Uh, the batteries ran out of electricity. The plant was, was black. And the um, pumps did not run. What, what happened next was the fuel overheated because of those radioactive daughter products. And when the f- nuclear fuel overheats, it attacks water and, and creates hydrogen gas. And the hydrogen gas is what you saw on the, uh, mon- the first Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Those explosions were caused because the water molecules were literally being ripped apart in the nuclear core, mm-hmm. and hydrogen gas was escaping and, and blowing up in the buildings. At that point, a meltdown was surely in progress. Um, the fuel becomes very brittle. And all these little pieces of uranium fall out and lie on the bottom of the nuclear reactor in a big blob. And and they get to 5,000 degrees. They are so radioactively hot that there's a blob at the bottom of these reactors um, of slag, basically, uranium slag, at at 5,000 degrees. So even though they were pumping water in, the... um, uh, you can't get to the middle of that slag, and it begins to melt its way through the reactor. So is that, um, the, is, is that what they call the core, melting through the vessel? Yes, right. that's correct. So, and that, the, and that, that, in effect, is, is a meltdown that, at that moment. Is that right? Yes. Now, um, they're, 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 now the authorities are trying to put a more nuanced spin on that, but the, the nuclear core is the thing that holds the uranium. And the reactor is like a giant pot. And, and so last week, it was clear to me that the uranium was lying on the bottom of this giant pot and melting its way through the metal. Um, it seems like today, um, at least the, the Guardian is quoting that in reactor two, the metal has become completely melted through. And now that molten uranium has come out of the pot, and into the very basement of the um, of the nuclear containment building. Right. So it's it's very serious. So, what indicates that that's actually occurring? I mean, if they can't get in there to to really get a good look, what are the indications of of a meltdown? Well, the 
reactor water level and reactor pressure have dropped. Right. And that would indicate a hole. And also the containment temperature and pressure have increased. So that would indicate that the lump of, of hot uranium has left the reactor and is now in the, um, in the containment. Now, the containment's been leaking for, for days. Um, you may recall uh, over the weekend, uh, some, some workers were exposed to extraordinarily high radiation and actually burned their feet from radiation. And that's because the containment was not containing. It wasn't doing its job and um, radioactive liquids were getting out. Well, this makes it worse because now there's uh, essentially no barriers between this hot molten blob of uranium and the outside of the building. The, the containment has stopped containing. So you, you mentioned that, that it was now sort of resting in a basement area. Is that not some containment? Um, yes, yes. Um, the building itself, though, we know to be leaking. Yep. So, um, so that, that radioactivity is getting out. Okay. Now, what happens is after it's melted through the, the seven inches of steel on the nuclear reactor, the next thing it abuts is, is concrete. So yep. there's just a, essentially standard industrial concrete underneath this reactor, probably um, maybe two meters, maybe a meter and a half of, of concrete under the reactor. And concrete has air trapped inside it. So now you've got hot, molten material laying up against the concrete, and it begins to pop like popcorn. Um, it begins to, they call it ablating. Really? Um, so the, the concrete will actually wind up getting eaten through as well. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and so it's a, it's a race against time. Gradually, that molten blob will cool. And the question is, will it cool before it breaks through the concrete or afterward, once it's through the concrete, it's in the water table and, uh, and in the ocean. So oh. it, 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 it is very serious. Arnold, if we can just step back for a moment. I mean, this image of this molten mass um, is quite powerful, but when, when the uranium fuel is inside the reactor, it's not in a sort of liquid blobby form, is it? Because a lot of people don't quite understand, you know, the very basic functions of a reactor. But isn't it encased in fuel rods, and what, what are they made of? Yes, the, um, the, the uranium are in little pellets, no bigger than the tip of your pinky. And they're stacked one on top of the other in a rod, and the rod is made of something called zirconium, um, and it's an alloy, so it's called zircaloy. Mm -hmm. And there are hundreds and thousands of those rods that hang like spaghetti in, inside a pot, mm -hmm. and the pot is a nuclear reactor. So when everything's working fine, the, the zircaloy, the cladding on the fuel, is around 500, 550 degrees. And, and after the Fukushima accident, when there was no water to cool the circuli, it exceeded 2,200 degrees. And we know that because at 2,200 degrees is when hydrogen is created. And those explosions that happened on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of uh, two weeks ago yeah. could not have occurred were it not for the fact that the fuel exceeded 2,200 degrees. Uh-huh. Yep. Now, once it gets to 2200 and, and this reaction occurs, it gets very brittle. And we have experience with this in the States. We had Three Mile Island. And um, if your viewers went up, um, actually, I have a picture on our website. If you go up on Fairwind's website, uh, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S, yep. we have a picture up of the Three Mile Island core after the accident. And all these fuel tubes that had zircaloy are destroyed. It looks like a forest that a, a, a tornado went through. God. Uh, and, and once they're destroyed, then those little pellets fall to the bottom of the reactor. Uh -huh. We had a, we almost melted down Three Mile Island here in the States. Um, the melting blob got um, about three inches through the concrete, uh, through the steel, rather, I'm sorry, uh, on the bottom of the nuclear reactor. Yep. But there were two differences. 
Three Mile Island was much less severe than Fukushima for two reasons. Three Mile Island only ran for about three months before its accident. So the fuel didn't have a lot of that decay heat. Mm. In it. Fukushima ran for four years. Mm -hmm. So there's an enormous amount of decay heat. And the other thing is that Three Mile Island was cooled after about 10 hours, whereas Fukushima didn't get water into it for days. No, no. And I, I wanted to ask you about that too. Why, why have efforts to cool the reactors at Fukushima been so futile? I mean, we've seen fire trucks, we've seen water being dropped from the air, apparently robots from the US were sent over. Why is it so difficult to cool the reactor? Um in part because it was built to be so strong. Mm -hmm. um, and these pumps, uh, you know, the, the, after the explosion, the, the pumps were contaminated with dust and dirt. And if you put dust and dirt in a hairdryer and turned it on, it wouldn't work. You know? mm -hmm. and, and the pumps were inundated by water. So, again, if you drop your hairdryer in the sink and turn it on, it's not going to work. So when they went to turn back the power, it was, it was nice to get the power into these buildings, but then as they energized the pumps, each pump sequentially didn't work because the electricity, there was so much junk inside the, the motors that they wouldn't turn. So they had to find an alternative way, and there was no clean water on site. And it was a desperation move, but they decided to pump in seawater. Yeah. Now, anybody who's ever had a boat, like your person, uh, uh, listeners, would, would appreciate that salt water and stainless steel really don't like each other. <laughs> and if it's hot stainless steel, it's even worse. So the nuclear reactor is, um, is stainless and then iron, and, and it's hot, and now we're pouring salt water in, which actually causes the reactor to be more brittle. Yeah. There was no water. It had to be done, but in the process, everybody knew that that – we made the, the uh, that, that TEPCO made the um, meltdown more likely in the long run because they wanted to prevent the meltdown in the short run. Yeah. Do, I mean, do you were you sort of watching all this and, and were you aware of other measures that they could have taken? Did they do everything that, you know, would have happened at a plant uh, in the United States, for example, had this happened there? Um, I hate to second-guess people in an emergency, mm. but I, I can tell you that the Japanese are incredibly skilled nuclear nuclear technicians, and, and they are as good as the technicians here in the United States. So um, I don't think um, it was because of poor training mm. or because of poor qualifications. I think they were hit by, by a, a wave that was uh, 18 meters high. Yeah when the plant was only designed for a 10-meter wave. And uh, at that point, um, all bets were off. Okay, so we have the, the melted uranium pellets that have sunk through to the bottom of Reactor 2 at the Fukushima nuclear power plant right now. What happens now? How can that, can that be cooled, that mass? Um, this is a very dangerous time. You know, we uh, every time you think it can't get any worse, it gets worse. Um, the the um, now you have a large mass of molten uranium at the at the bottom of the containment. There's probably some fuel inside the reactor that is still there, but now the reactor's dry because there's a hole in the bottom. That creates more hydrogen. You yeah. can, the, the fuel can create more hydrogen, and you can explode the containment. Um, and that's, that gets to the point of being very similar to, uh, to Chernobyl. I see, because does that mean that the, the radioactive elements are then just totally dispersed into the air? Yes, you're right. absolutely right. Right, right. This is a, this is a play that's not going to have a happy ending. Or, you know, we're really fighting over making the ending not as yeah. bad as it could be, but yeah. it's going to end poorly. Lots of media, Arnold, have been uh, very conscious to keep saying, you know, this is nothing like a Chernobyl-style accident. There are few similarities with Chernobyl. 
Is that accurate? Are there some similarities? And, 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 I mean, could they still be on the way like you just suggested? Well, in a lot of ways, it's worse than Chernobyl because Chernobyl only had one nuclear reactor core. And Fukushima has units one, two, and three, plus what's in their fuel pools, which aren't being cooled either. So there's about eight cores worth of uranium inside the Fukushima units. Now, the um, unit four was shut down. There was no uranium in the core. And the fuel had been moved over to the spent fuel pool, which is also way up in top of that building. And when the power went off, there was no way to cool it, and it boiled dry. Um, Brookhaven National Labs here in the States has a, um, I did a study that if the fuel pool catches fire, at a nuclear power plant, 138,000 people will die. So it's very, it, it still is a potentially very serious problem. Because the fuel pools have more radioactivity in them than the reactor cores themselves. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Right. And the fuel pools are not inside a containment. They're sitting way up there in the air with the roof blown off. Good Lord. So I wanted to ask you, at Fukushima, are the pools adjacent to the reactors? Are they on top? Are they sort of spread out all over the plant? They're immediately adjacent to the top of the reactor. Oh, And right. so those buildings with the top blown off, you should be able to look down and see a blue fuel pool there because that's where it was. And I've looked at every satellite and every uh, high-resolution picture coming out of there, and I can't see any water. So there's a real risk of a, of a fuel pool fire and um, what that does is it, it makes the plutonium volatile. And, um, and, and I'm sure Helen could speak more about this than, than, uh, than I can. But a very small particle of plutonium, a, a microgram, a millionth of a gram, if it lodges in your lung, can, um, can cause lung cancer. Yes, well, I know I've been I've been reading reports that plutonium has been detected in the soil at the facility, um, but of course authorities are rushing to, you know, quell any concerns about that. But I I do know from listening to to Helen Caldicott and and people that she's interviewed that it's highly carcinogenic, um, and I guess people are going to be really worried about about that. And reactor three is, is the reactor that contains fuel that is a, a combination of plutonium and uranium in the core. Is that right, Arnold? Yes, that's right. But all the reactors have plutonium in them because when they start fresh, they start with uranium-235, and that's where the fissions occur. Mm -hmm. But then they, the other element in there is uranium-238, and that becomes plutonium. So over the four years, almost half of the power at the end of the reactor's life comes from plutonium being fissioned. So all the reactors have plutonium. Unit 3 has more uh -huh. because they were doing an experiment by actually adding in additional plutonium, um, but they all have plutonium in them. As do the cooling pools, is that right, where the spent rods are placed after they've been used? Yes, that's right. absolutely correct. Okay. So the reactor cores in one, two, three, yep. plus the fuel pools in yep. one, two, three, and four, all have plutonium in. Are the are the cooling pools being cooled as the reactor cores, or do they do they just need to be kept covered with water? Um, they are trying desperately to make that happen. Um, right. I am not convinced that it is, but um, what they what the, the TEPCO has done is they have these the fire pumper trucks that were shooting water up onto the roof? Yeah. Well, they were hoping it would fill that fueling pool. Oh, I see. Uh, but the pool is enormous. I mean, the pool has, um, I'm going to give you U.S. numbers, I'm sorry, about um, 60,000 gallons of, of water in it. Mm. And those trucks only contain about 1,000 gallons of water. So, oh. um, And it's boiling off, and there might be leaks. Right. So the, the net effect is, that they need to do what they're doing, but I'm not convinced that it's enough. No. Well, Arnold, what does this mean for the five other reactors, or particularly one, one through three? I mean, if, if Unit 2 
has had this this situation now where the uranium has actually melted through the the uh, through the containment vessel what can we expect will reactors one and three potentially go the same way the unit two was a little more damaged than unit one and three right even though uh it looked better it's the one that still has its roof on it yep. in fact when it had an explosion it had more internal damage but the pressure was kept inside so unit two had a little more damage but the you know fundamentally you're absolutely right. They're really, uh, it is possible that one and three could go down the same path. All right. Well, thanks very much for your insight about all that. We'll, we'll keep our eye on it, of course. And, and maybe when Dr. Caldicott's back, back in the country and back in the chair, we might have you on again, Arnold, for, for another talk about this. Well, I would, I would, in, I would be honoured to talk about it. Uh, you know, I, I think my heart goes out to the to the workers. I mean, these people are um, are incredibly brave uh, individuals, and you know, really, some of them are sacrificing their lives so that the um, so that the rest of their their Japanese brethren can can survive, and um, they are they are very brave and deserve to be honored. Absolutely. And have you noticed amongst? Um colleagues and, and former colleagues, perhaps a different mood now since this has happened or more reservations about the industry itself? What, what are people sort of feeling in the States? Um, the industry uh, is telling Congress that it can't happen here, mm. and um, which I absolutely disagree with. It, it's not about a tsunami. It's about um, a single point of vulnerability. Mm. And, and it, it could be a a, uh, here we have hurricanes that push a tidal, um, uh, uh, a tidal, oh, I can't remember the name of it, a tidal wave toward the shore that could cause the same problem. Or inland on, on the Mississippi, we had 100-year floods that almost did the same thing to nuclear power plants. So we have the, um, there are individual things Mother Nature can throw at every one of these plants. Um, that uh, that could cause the same exact problem as Fukushima. And I don't think the United States has learned that lesson yet. Well, let's hope that they uh, might be open to <laughs> some discussion about that in the coming months. Thanks very much, Arnold Gunderson, for talking to us today. Thank you very much for having me. Today on If You Love This Planet, we've just heard from Arnold Gunderson, who is an energy advisor with an organisation called Fairwinds Associates Incorporated in Vermont, United States. Now, the website that Arnold mentioned during his interview is www.fairwinds.com. That's spelt F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S, fairwinds.com, if you'd like more information. Now on the program, we're going to go to Boston on the east coast of the United States. Dr. Helen Caldicott is on the line. She's been touring around North America and is soon off to Europe as part of a lecture tour. So, Helen Caldicott, are you there? Yes, I am, Jasmine William. <laughs> um, we, just, we just heard from Arnold Gunderson. Um, who described what's happened in the last 24 hours at Reactor 2 at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. So Arnold described how the uranium fuel within that reactor core has actually melted through the bottom of the containment vessel um, and is now resting on the concrete floor of the basement area of that reactor. So... Um, it, it, it's quite an image that that molten that molten mass. Helen, what are they going to do now in terms of keeping that mass cooled? And and can you cool a mass like that? You know, I'm not a nuclear engineer. Um, I I don't know how they're going to keep it cool except by pouring more water onto it. But that could create a massive steam explosion. The other thing is that the molten mass, it's the sort of lava mass, if you will, like a volcano, um, reacts with the concrete and the zirconium that was around the fuel rods into which the uranium pellets were packed and could produce a, a big, big hydrogen sort of bubble and that could produce a hydrogen explosion which would rupture the containment vessel, which at the moment 
I think is holding fast. If the containment vessel blows, a huge, huge amount of radiation will get out and it will emulate Chernobyl. And depending on the way the wind blows, if it blows towards Tokyo and, and south towards Japan, that's going to be absolutely devastating. Or the wind could blow west to east, which it normally does, and blow this huge, devastating cloud over to a, towards North America. Um, and, and rain or snow will bring the radiation down to Earth, as it did at Chernobyl, and it will soon circle the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. So we're on the brink of a possible catastrophe, but no one can predict what will happen. Well, I'm in Australia um, in, a, in a small fishing village where you live too, Helen. What about the Southern Hemisphere? Can this plume travel to the Southern Hemisphere? The two air masses the northern and southern hemisphere tend not to mix at the equator. So the radiation will circle the globe in the northern hemisphere and there will be little mixing with the air of the southern hemisphere. However, obviously some of it is going to be rained into the ocean and that, and, and that ocean currents move throughout both hemispheres. Uh, so, you know, there will be, if, if this should happen, um, there will be exposure, exposure through the food chain in the ocean through the fish because uh, fish concentrate these internal emitters, tonium, cesium, strontium and, and many others, about 100 others, by orders of magnitude at each step of the food chain, as in algae, then little then crustaceans, then little fish, then big fish, then humans. So um, it, it will pose health threats actually throughout the globe and what people have to understand is that if you're exposed to radiation which doesn't kill you in the first couple of weeks because it's so intense but um, you inhale radioactive iodine or strontium-90 or eat cesium-137 in your food it takes a long long time to develop cancer from any time from two to 60 years and that's called the latent period of carcinogenesis or the incubation time for cancer when the cancer arises, it doesn't wear a little sign saying that you uh, developed this bone cancer or leukemia uh, from strontium-90 you ate in some fish 20 years ago. And that's kind of the ace up the sleeve of the nuclear industry, this long, cryptogenic, silent, latent period um, of incubation for cancer. Um, whereas if I sneezed on you within two days, you're going to be sneezing and have a cough having a cold mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. measles, mumps, chicken pox and rubella take three weeks to incubate. But this is a long, long time. And everyone has to understand that. Now, when, when, when Chernobyl exploded, it had only been operating for three months. One third of the inventory got out. Um, and, you know, there's, an, there's the equivalent amount of a 1,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs long-lived radiation in the reactor core. So who knows how much would get out and how massive the explosion would be. What One thing about Chernobyl was it had graphite um, moderating rods like carbon in a pencil, lead pencil, and it burnt. And the, the tremendous heat from the burning of the graphite helped to lift the radioactive cloud right up into the stratosphere. Um, this will not be burning, but, but there could be a massive explosion which would release a huge amount of, of radiation from that molten mass on the concrete floor. And the other thing to know is that, of course, if there is an explosion in Reactor 2, there are four, three other reactors at great risk. A two, uh, five and six, Numbers five and six are not at such a risk, but but the cooling pools are also at risk, as as Arnold Gunston described. And but it will mean probably that the workers trying to stabilise the situation will have to evacuate simply because the radiation doses will be so high. And then God only knows what would happen. Mm -hmm. I'm projecting into the future. I may be wrong, but I'm just painting some scenarios. And what people need to understand is. Everyone's talking about low-dose radiation, and that's not appropriate. If you inhale a microgram or a millionth of a gram of plutonium, and there are 
250 kilos of plutonium in this reactor probably. That's enough to give you cancer. And the surrounding cells, it, the, the alpha particle emitted from the plutonium only travels a very short distance within the lung and the surrounding cells get a whopping dose. Some will mutate to develop cancer years later. The rest of the lung gets nothing. Now, to call that low-dose radiation is a total misnomer because the, the cells that are actually affected get a very high dose. And it's the same with strontium that deposits in bone and giving the surrounding cells a high dose. So you must understand the concept of internal emitters. And if you go to the webpage called nuclearfreeplanet.org, it's described there. And if you look at my book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer, um, internal emitters are described there. And that's what is not being discussed by any so-called health um, expert in this area, either on television or radio or in the newspapers. So we're not being adequately educated. No, that's right. I have not seen... I have not seen any um, footage on television or, or read any reports about that um, mm. at this well, point. Well, it's imperative to understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, we know that plutonium has been detected in soil at the, facili at the facility. Um, the government in Japan is saying it's not at levels that threaten human health, though. Um, That's but ridiculous because all plutonium threatens human health. You know, when they injected it in beagle dogs, there wasn't a dose low enough that they didn't give all the dogs cancer. Not a millionth of a gram of plutonium, but a, a thousand millionth of a gram or a billionth of a gram, 10 to the minus 9 grams. Now, if it's in the soil, it tends not to bioconcentrate in the food chain. However, if the soil dries up and it, it, it's very hot and the wind blows the soil, then people can inhale it into their lungs. Also, I haven't read of any plutonium measurements in the air, and Arnie Gunderson talked about that. He said it's easy enough in a helicopter to uh, take a sample of air and come down and, and, and measure it for plutonium because plutonium emits only an alpha particle, not like other isotopes which emit gamma, which is like X-rays, and you can easily measure that. Mm -hmm. um, an alpha particle is composed of two protons and two neutrons, and you have to have a special method of determining alpha emitters, but that's relatively easily done. That haven't, hasn't been done, and I think what is now becoming very obvious is that TEPCO, the uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company, really is operating in the dark, literally and figuratively. Mm. They've only just attached the electricity and got light in the control rooms, but certainly not on the pumps or anything else. So they, they are just almost as confused as everyone else. Mm. And what really I don't understand is that the International Atomic Energy Agency, with all its knowledge, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in America didn't send its specialists over to help these people at TEPCO try and work out what's happening and control the situation. So it's really been, you know, a muddling disaster, I think, from the beginning. Mm. And, you know... As you and your colleagues have been saying, it's really it's a global health issue, um, and I yes. I just think that you know many many journalists are intimidated by by the science and and the basic biology um, because you know if 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 you didn't do much biology at high school and haven't done any since really, you know very, very little about, about what you were just describing. Well, that's true, Jasmine, but it's relatively easy to understand it. And I, I, Not that I want to sell my books per se, but I wrote that book, Nuclear Power's Not the Answer, as a sort of medical guide. Like, I had to read Grey's Anatomy to become a, a doctor and many other books. It, uh, it, people must read that book to learn and understand how radiation affects cells and how internal emitters affect cells. It's quite clear to me now that most journals have no or little understanding at all of what is happening. And also doctors who are talking and health specialists also don't understand. Mm -hmm. So the educational effort has been very poor. Yeah. Um, we 
I've been trying to educate people for a long time. But, I, you know, I think until there's such a disaster like this, mm. people don't, they prefer not to think about it. They don't want to know to their detriment. Mm. Well, you know, just back to plutonium for a minute, we know that Reactor 3 um, has a, a, a fuel that is a combination of plutonium and uranium. Um, and plutonium's highly carcinogenic, as you just explained. But what Arnold Gunderson um, reminded me and our listeners was that, in fact, all those reactors have plutonium within them because plutonium's created from the uranium fission process. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and uranium is an efficient fission product. A fission product is when a uranium atom splits apart and 200 new elements are formed, all of which are parts or broken pieces of the uranium atom. Plutonium is formed when uranium-238 captures a neutron, so it's heavier and a bigger atom than uranium per se. Uh, it's not a fission product, but in fact 250 kilograms of plutonium are formed in a reactor per year. Plutonium, um, you only need uh, 2.5 kilos to make yourself a bomb, so any country with a reactor can make many bombs per year, hydro, uh, atomic bombs. And plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years, and you multiply half-life by 10 or 20 to get its total radiological life. So it lasts virtually forever in our terms mm. and understanding. Um, so we're dealing with something that is really diabolical, absolutely diabolical, and it's carcinogenic and in very minute amounts. Well, the IAEA the International Atomic Energy Agency have, you know, continued to call for calm. Um, as a physician, what, what, what does this mean for the area around Fukushima? Yeah, I think a large areas, as around Chernobyl, will be uninhabitable for the rest of time. People won't be able to live there anymore. And already I think that the Japanese government is saying things like that and the Japanese Prime Minister. So... Look, we're in the middle of an ongoing catastrophe. No one really understands it. But if you look at it clearly from a medical point of view, it's, it's very, very alarming. Um, and I have to say, you know, if, if there really is an explosion and this radiation is scattered around the Northern Hemisphere, I, I think it's going to cause millions of extra cancers. And we know what happened at Chernobyl um, the New York Academy of Sciences, which the New York Times is not talking about, produced a report not long ago uh, where 5,000 papers written in Russian were for the first time translated into English. Mm -hmm. And they found that um, up to nearly a million people have already died from Chernobyl, but it's an ongoing catastrophe. It never goes away because... 40% of the land mass in Europe is still radioactive and will remain so for hundreds of years, meaning that, you know, much of the food grown in Europe will be radioactive for a long, long time. And you, if you eat radioactive food, of course, you're exposed to internal emitters that get into your bones and into your bloodstream and into your lung and the like uh, and can give you cancer years later. So... Taking the example of Chernobyl and applying that to this accident, it, it really is very, very alarming. And I think everyone needs to read that report from the New York Academy of Sciences, and it's called Chernobyl. All right, Helen Caldercott, you're touring around at the moment giving lectures. Um, uh, you've been in Canada, you're now in America, and off to Berlin and then London. What are people saying to you? Um, in Canada and America anyway? How are they feeling about what's happening in Japan? Are they really scared? Are they, are they uh, talking about the, the US's 104 nuclear reactors? What, what's the, what's the um, mood? Well, I've been in New Mexico, which is a national sacrifice state, and as I landed in the Albuquerque airport, there are 2,100 or so hydrogen bombs buried underground just next to the airport. Um, New Mexico is all about nuclear weapons. Los Alamos Labs is there, Sandy Labs, and they're all into making nu new nuclear weapons. So I talked a lot about that, but I did also talk about Fukushima. And the people, uh, it's hard to arouse Americans. They're kind of psychically numbed. But I 
am really at the end of my tether. Um, I've been talking about this for 40 years and now this disaster is happening. So I just tell them how I feel. I mean, I explain it all in medical terms and then I just tell them how I feel. And I said it's totally appropriate to be emotional and totally appropriate to be angry because um, the fight and flight mechanism when you're threatened helps you to, you know, jump a fence six feet high if you're chased by a bull and it's appropriate to be angry and frightened and and to do something about it. So I'm kind of trying to allow people or give people permission to feel their real emotions. And the response is quite extraordinary. People just stand up and clap and they cry. And I found that too in Canada. I've just been up there um, at the Darlington hearings where they want to build four new nuclear power plants on an earthquake fault on Lake Ontario, very close to Toronto, which has three million people. And uh, the nuclear power people talk absolute rot. It's euphemistic garbage that I can't understand and neither can anyone else. It's the way, oh, John Howard used to speak and Kevin Rudd, stuff you can't really understand. And I just spoke about the medical effects and, you know, that every male in the Northern Hemisphere has a tiny load of plutonium in his testicles from the weapons testing days and that really freaked them out. So when you get down to the sort of coalface, the bottom line, people do listen. They need to hear a doctor talking about what this means because it's all medical. Well, next week we'll um, we'll get back in touch with you and we'll we'll have another update about what's happening at Fukushima and look forward to you being back in Australia at the microphone in a couple of weeks, Helen. Thank you, Jasmine Williams, my producer for everything. <laughs>